Good morning, and happy Mother's Day to all our Pleasant Grove mothers. And always remember that God is good. All, all the time. time. And all the time. God, God is, is good. good. Today's scripture comes from uh, the New Testament book of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. I ask that you stand as you're able to hear these words from John's gospel. These should be familiar. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I will go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The first grade Sunday school teacher asked her children this question, how many of you want to go to heaven? All the children raised their hand, but one little boy named Derek didn't. When the teacher asked Derek, why didn't you raise your hand? He simply said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Taylor, but Mommy said we have to go home right after church. There are many songs about heaven. Eric Clapton's song, Tears in Heaven. Bob Dylan's Knocking on Heaven's Door. And in our hymnal, if you look up number 701, you'll see that it is When We All Get to Heaven. One song by country artist Kitty Wells asked the question, How far is heaven? The answer is that heaven can be as close as your heart or as far away as eternity. Contrary to this thought, though, is one worldview that states this, and I quote, The only heaven there is is the happiness that we experience here on earth. Well, Jesus disproves that view as he definitely believed in a place called heaven, a place for us to be. The Bible ends with the book of Revelation, as you know saying there is a new heaven and a new earth where God's people will live forever together with Him. In a recent Fox News poll, 85% of the Americans who were surveyed said, number one, they believed in heaven, and number two, they believed they were going to be there. My question to you this Sunday morning, this Mother's Day, is this. Is there such a place as heaven? Psychiatrist Paul Turner begins one of his popular books with these words. Basically, we are always looking for a place, for somewhere to be. I think he's absolutely right. From the first breath of birth to the final breath of death, we are in need of a place, a place to be. Maybe that's why John 14 is such a beloved passage. Jesus tells us, let not your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house are many rooms, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Jesus is preparing a place for us, a place to be. And when I think about a place to be, I think about three things. The first thing that comes to mind is I think about family. God made families so we could have a place to be. That's why families are so essential to our society. We need a place to get our basic needs, to, uh, to, to, to love and to be loved, a place to nurture and to be nurtured. That's what families are all about. Henry Nguyen says we are people and we all have an address, but we're seldom home. We have houses, some of them quite elaborate, but do we have homes? That is to say, a place of safety, a place of love, a place of acceptance. Robert Frost once said, Home is a place when you go there, they have to take you in. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible will tell us that home is a place where when you go there, they want to take you in. One of Jesus' parables in Luke 15 is a prime example of this. When he saw him, the father of the prodigal son ran. Folks, he ran to greet his long-lost wayward son. And I'm sure he was shouting with every step he took, Welcome home, my son. Welcome home. Can't you just feel what this father must have been feeling when he saw at a distance that son returning? We all 
need places like that, don't we? Pastor Howard Ole shares a story about a move he and his wife had to make. While his oldest son, Wes, was working and living in Florida, Pastor Oles moved from Lexington, Kentucky to Louisville, Kentucky to take on a new job as a Methodist pastor. When he learned of the move, he informed his son, who was uh, in his carefree young adult form, simply said, that's fine. That's not my house anymore. You can move. I don't have a problem with that. He went on to tell his father that he was now on his own and that they could go, mom and dad could go wherever they wanted to go, whenever they wanted to go. All was well, Pastor Ole said, until about three weeks later, he got a letter from his son, a six-page letter. It was a long letter and a very sad letter from his son, who suddenly realized that his place to be had been replaced, that he, in fact, had lost his place to be. And when I think of a place to be, I think about this church. God made the church so that we would have a special place, a special place to be. Folks, a church isn't about a denomination, Baptist, Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, or Methodist. A church isn't about a building, although we certainly can take pride in what we have constructed over the past few years. Nor is a church at all about a pastor. A church is about people. A church is about you. It's about a community of faith. It's a special place where people can love and be loved, a place to form a vital, lifelong relationship with your God and a lifelong relationship with other Christians. The church is about you. So as your assigned pastor, I want to thank you for your love of this church, for your dedication to this holy place. And with that dedication, I ask that you remember uh, three things. With so many things pulling for your attention, I need you to know, number one, to remember that your church needs you needs your prayers, needs your presence, needs your gifts, and certainly needs your service. Number two, remember that your church needs your undivided devotion each and every day. And number three, remember that as a Christian, you, like me, is a minister. You are a minister as well. So we all need to do what we can to create a place where others, maybe visitors, can find acceptance and start, can start developing a relationship with God. A place where people, whether they're young or old, married or single, rich or poor, can receive the love of God and a life in Jesus Christ. Lastly, when I think of a place to be, I think of my heavenly home. I go to prepare a place for you. This place to be has been prepared by Jesus. It has many rooms. I'm pretty sure there's a welcome mat sitting in front of each one of those doors. There's nothing about heaven that suggests there's any limited access. It's big enough to receive all who've gone before and those yet to come. In our world, we'll find that all of our motels have a no vacancy sign. If there's a flashing neon sign in heaven, you can bet it reads, everyone welcome. Folks, when your time here is over, have no anxiety about your place to be in heaven. God has a place there for you. Jesus said so. Whenever Nina and I are expecting company, we scurry oftentimes to prepare for their arrival. We pick up things, we dust this, I vacuum, Nina cleans the toilets. I think she lost the coin toss on that one. That's kind of what Jesus was telling his disciples in John 14 too. To paraphrase just a little, I need to get some things ready for you guys. I go to prepare a place for you. A place to be, is what Jesus was saying. A place beaming with relationships. The true beauty of heaven doesn't lie in the crystal chandeliers or the golden streets. Oh no. What makes heaven heaven is who is there. And who is there are people who have gone before. Family and friends. People we've loved from long ago. The separations we have endured sometimes for years will all come to an end. Pain will disappear. And listen for it. Listen for it. We will be in the presence of God. Because of His radical love for us, we cannot be separated from Him, even by the power of death. In this prepared place, this place to be, we will stand face to face 
with our Lord and Savior. In verse 14, 3, Jesus says, that where I am, there you may be also. In 2012, ABC aired a special edition of the news magazine 2020. The special was a Barbara Walters documentary titled, Heaven, Where Is It? How Do We Get There? She says it's the most interesting documentary she ever had the pleasure to develop. Miss Walter said, I think there's a great need, a need for soul searching in this country. People want to know about life after death. Barbara Walters at that time, and perhaps still is, was a self-confessed non-believer. She says she didn't expect there to be anything like a heaven anywhere. Nevertheless, she concluded her documentary saying this, and I quote, if you believe that when you die, you go to a better place, it certainly makes life more comfortable on earth. Jesus is preparing a place for you and a place for me, a place to be with him, a place to be with family, a place to be with friends. My question is, how do I get there? The answer is that to get to heaven requires that we rely on just one single relationship. Listen to what Jesus tells us in 14.6. No one comes to the Father but through me. With that nine-word sentence, Jesus struck a fatal blow to the doctrine of universalism, which says that all roads lead to heaven and that one way to get there is no better than the other because we're all going to get there. There is a reason why only Jesus Christ can be the way to heaven. Between the human race and God stands a barrier, and that barrier is called sin. This barrier is a wall that has to be torn down, a gap that has to be bridged, an ocean that must be crossed. However we want to say it, if we're going to be reconciled with God, our sin must be dealt with to God's satisfaction. And the only way to deal with that sin is through His Son, who lived a sinless life, who died a sacrificial death to pay for everything we've ever done wrong in our lives. If there had been any other way for us to ultimately reach God, Jesus would not have had to die. But because He came, because He lived, and because He died, this shows there's no other way that our salvation can be achieved. Jesus' resurrection proved that He was who He said He was. Furthermore, it gave him the exclusive right to say, no one comes to the Father but through me. Unlike any other religious leader who has ever lived, Jesus authenticated who he was by exactly what he did. He fulfilled scores of century-old prophecies that were made long before he was ever born. Jesus fulfilled his own prophecy by being raised from the dead. Folks, Jesus isn't, is not a good way to heaven. Jesus is not a better way to heaven. Jesus is not the best way to heaven. Jesus is the only, only way to heaven. I'll close with a true story, one that I've told you once before in a sermon. The phone rang at 1 a.m. in the home of Dr. Leo Winters, a Chicago surgeon. It was the hospital telling him that a young boy had been tragically mangled in a car accident. Dr. Winter's hands were probably the only ones in the city skilled enough to save this young boy's life. So he dressed quickly, climbed into his car, and decided, because time was the essence, to take a shortcut to the hospital, which caused him to drive through a rather dangerous part of the city. He came to a red light and stopped. A man opened the door, grabbed him, pulled him out, and said, I'm taking your car. He took his phone, he took his car keys, and sped off. Dr. Winter had tried to explain that he was on an emergency call to the hospital, but that didn't stop the man from doing this. Dr. Winters arrived late. It took him 45 minutes to finally get to a phone and call a cab. He arrived at the hospital only to learn that the young boy had died. Dr. Winters was told that the father was in the chapel, probably at the altar, waiting for him. Dr. Winters entered the chapel hoping to console the man. And as he approached the weeping man kneeling at the altar, he noticed he was wearing a blue flannel shirt and a red baseball cap. The boy's father looked up at the doctor and realized in horror what he'd done. He had stolen the car of the only man that could save his son's life. Folk, there's only one person that can save our life. If we intend to go to heaven, 
we'd better make sure we know how to get to that final place to be. Amen.